moderator for this webinar. Um, so if you can hear me, I want you to type which city, which country that you are listening this webinar from. So where I am, I'm currently in Bangkok, in Thailand, so Salaika. I'm also aware we have a lot of friends um, from different countries uh, in this region. Um, so Namaste, Mabuhai, um, Salama, um, Salam Alaikum. Um, yeah, I think that's all I can say. <laughs> um, right, so yeah, we have very diverse um, audience. Uh, thank you so much um, for typing where you're from. So um, I hope that um, if you're not speaking, um, please stay, um, turn your microphone off so we can make sure that everyone else can hear the speaker. Okay, cool. So yeah, um, before we officially start, um, just want to quickly um, do a quick self introduction. Um, I am from, I'm working, currently working in UNDP. For those who aren't familiar with the, this acronym, UNDP stands for, for uh, United Nations Development Program. Um, so I will also introduce um, what we are doing in the project. Um, but before we officially start, um, I usually like to do an, um, an energizer. Um, so before we do host conference, we can stand together, we can hold hands, we can you know jump together. Of course, right now we're all listening from the webinar, so we aren't able to do that. But still, I'm gonna introduce um, something that I really enjoy when I'm sitting in front of the desk um, for the whole day. It's to do some neck exercise. Okay, so if you can see me, please follow me. So um, let's spend one minute to do some neck uh, stretching. So let's all look up and then on count to five. One, two, three, four, five. And then we look down. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we turn to left. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we turn to right. One, two, three, four, five. And then you gently put your hands on the back of your head and then lengthen this part. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. And then you change size, change side. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, cool. That's just a quick energizer. Uh, and I know that it's late in the afternoon or evening for some of you. Um, so I hope that this will keep you active and fresh. Sorry, there was an echo. Oh, okay. So please um, turn your mic on mute. Okay, cool. Cool. All right, um, without further ado, let's start. So um, in this introduction, I briefly mentioned, uh, um, I'm not sure how many of you have this question. What does UN lead, how people think about entrepreneurship is, you know, um, find a business opportunity and get a lot of profit and create a big company and then make a lot of money. So what is UN doing in between this, um, you know, this crazy business world? Well, um, I'm not sure if you noticed this um, or not, but I would say that um, with, the gen with, the, with the youth generation, um, you know, millennials, uh, Gen Z, Gen X, Gen Y, um, we're trying, we're, uh, you know, bringing our own identity to the world of development. We also aren't satisfied of a traditional definition of entrepreneurship. We're also unsatisfied of, you know, make, make, um, doing business is only for money purpose. So we're also redefining what is entrepreneurship. And then there's an emerging concept called social entrepreneurship um, or social business. You know, um, you're creating, um, you're making profit, you are doing business, but you're also doing it to provide livelihood for people. You're also solving the problems of, you know, poverty, hunger, gender equality, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's where we found where our And if, if you look at traditionally the development agency, which is, um, you know, uh, United Nations, um, uh, you know, 
World Bank, um, ADB, or all, uh, this international organization doing with engaging young people for development? Um, first of all, it's not really actions oriented. Um, secondly, it doesn't um, reach the scale of you know engaging as many people as possible. Lastly, um, it's not. Um, it doesn't take. It doesn't have a proper you know day to day follow up, day to day actions. Why? I'm saying that um, it's because if you think about how um, the development agencies organize events, workshops, or seminar or conference, which means that we come together for a conference, and when the conference is done, we say it's nothing that we can bring home and then and do it day by day, right? So um, social entrepreneurship is with youth collab, it's something that we think is a way to engage young people in a large scale, something that we can do in a day-to-day -day basis. Because we are, if we are running a social enterprise, if you're running a social business, we're doing this every day, right? Um, and then the thing is that um, there's a, 2030 um, sustainable development goals and um, a lot of um, international um, these big organizations were trying to think about how can we effectively engage young people not just you know um, you know as a group of you know, uh, who can just talk about it but also do something about it at the same time um how can young people is one of um the solutions one of the approach where we hope to engage young people through actions through solutions through day-to-day -day operations so um with that um i just want to say thank you so much um the organizers to invite us to host to moderate this sessions because we truly um, we're truly believer of um, social entrepreneurship for youth development. And I believe that today we're going to talk a lot on um, different aspects um, around youth development, around social entrepreneurship, around entrepreneurship. Adi Kari, um, Ms. Um, from Youth for Environment, Education and Development Foundation. Over to you. Hello everyone, I hope you all are hearing me clearly. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Youth Webinar on Sustaining Economy, Public Health and Environment for the Future of Humanity. This webinar is a joint initiative and co-organized by Youth for Environment Education and Development Foundation, YFIT Foundation, Youth Collab, United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth, UNMGCY. I'd like to thank all the collaborators for lending help to YFIT in this webinar. Now, before getting started, let us know something about YFIT Foundation. As you can see, it was established in 2017 with a group of young and enthusiastic people with an aim of advancing the rights of youth, including indigenous youth in the country. In the short span of time, YFIT has a good national and international platform and has done following activities such as STZ Asia Project, Nepalese People Forum on Sustainable Development 2019, Kathmandu Climate Talk, and so on and so forth. Now moving forward, Today, we have four personalities as presenter, 
and they are Miss Kamiwai Villero. She is co-founder of Project Bengal and Apothecario. And Mr. Asis Kuller, he is board member of UN Mesa Group for Children and Youth and Children and Youth International. Mr. Victor Anthony Lopez Carmer, he is co-chair Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. And Mr. Paul Takma, who is executive director of Kaping Foundation in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And for synthesis and call for action, we have Ms. Pregni Boya Guevara. She's founder of STZ Villages Foundation, UN Advisor, Asian Youth Council, and Mr. Busan Dahal, who is Executive Director, Kids of Kathmandu, Country Chair of Global Dignity Global Chapa. Today, we shall be talking about following agendas. Economic consequences due to COVID-19, effect of COVID-19 in following public health, environmental effects of COVID-19, and role of youth entrepreneurs. And we are expecting to inspire youth towards leadership and social entrepreneurship, sharing our valuable in information and to put limelight on the possibilities of human and economic development imposed by the pandemic that the whole world is suffering. In case you missed any section or would like to hear this webinar again, do not worry. We have recorded version available on my Facebook page. All you have to do is just go through our Facebook page and you can hear it and see it whenever you want. And you can also share it among your friends. There is also Q&A section at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to ask any question and they will all be acknowledged and answered. You can comment your question on the chat box. Feel free to ask, do not hesitate to ask. And I can still see people, some people joining us now. So for those who are just signing in, welcome again. Thanks for joining us and let's get started. Now I'd like to request Ms. Linka to start this webinar officially. I hope we all learn something new today. Thank you. This is me, Rubina Adhikari. Thank you so much, uh, Rubina. Um, yes, so those who just joined, very warm um, well, welcome to the webinar. Um, once again, I'm Linka, your moderator um, for this webinar. Um, so right now, without further ado, let's invite our first speaker, um, Ms. Kamai um, Bileros, the co-founder of Project Bankar and Amphosectario Startup Entrepreneur of the, in the Philippines. And once again, if you have any questions that you want to ask the speaker, please feel, feel, feel free to type in the chat. And now let's all give a round of applause um, to Ms. Kamai, uh, Kamai Villaros. Villaros, welcome. Um. Hi everyone. Good evening or good morning. Um, can I request Krishna to uh, present my presentation? Thank you. Thank you, Emma Puhai. Hi everyone, so I'll introduce myself. Um, I am Kame Villero. So currently I'm a graduate student here in the Philippines. So I'm taking up um, energy engineering and also I co-founded two social enterprises here, the Project Bangkal and Apothecario. So later on, I will share to you our challenges um, during this pandemic. So my presentation is Survival 101 for Startups and Social Enterprises. Next. Um, um, next. So, um, I just want to give you an overview of the distribution by enterprise sizes here in the country. Oh, so 99.57% of the enterprises here in the Philippines are MSMEs or micro, small, and medium enterprises, and only 0.5%. Uh, 0.43% are large companies. From MSMEs, 820,795 are micro enterprises. So, what are micro enterprises? So, 
These are traditional businesses with less than 10 employees. Meanwhile, 86,895 are small enterprises, while only 4,018 are medium enterprises. So as you can see, we are a country of micro enterprises. So as the lockdown prolongs, millions of jobs will be affected, especially if the products and services they offer are non-essential. So what are essential sectors that play key roles during the pandemic? So these are the essential sectors. Um, farming and fishing, agro-fishery store, food, food preparation establishments, or take-out delivery, Health-related production, production of medicine, PPEs, and masks, and basic utilities, electricity, water, and internet. So as you can see, during the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. people are not buying goods. We are not buying cars, but we primarily spend our money for food. So this pandemic shows that sectors related to food and health are extremely important and needed to be prioritized, not only during the pandemic, but also after the pandemic. So if our doctors are the frontliners, our backliners are the farmers and the fishermen. Next. On the other hand, the severely affected sectors are the manufacturing industries, uh, detail, transportation, and tourism. On the other hand, for a startup to survive during the pandemic, first, um, um, of course, there are many challenges during the pandemic. So one of the challenges, it's harder for non-essential goods to pivot. Why it's hard for non-essential goods to pivot? Because um, essential goods are the primarily, they are primarily for that right now during the pandemic. So we must consider pivoting, looking for another revenue stream that can be categorized as essential products for success. <laughs> Next, um, reliance on long supply chains is exposed. Uh, reliance on supply chains are exposed uh, vulnerability. So this one especially if for example, if the farm is located in the mountains and transportation is restricted during the enhanced community quarantine, tons of vegetables are undelivered. So also, if your raw materials come uh, come from other countries, the delivery really takes time. Third, um, Krishna, can you just go back? Thank you for the presentation. Okay. Okay. Third, um, can you go back? I am sorry, can you go back? Third, um, because startups before and during the pandemic, um, we really need capital investments. So some are selling their shares to investors, causing a high startup valuation. So accepting a higher startup valuation it imposes high risk and greater pressure for a startup. For um, the disrupted distribution chains and channels, since moving of goods right now are restricted, and most and most are closed, so it's kind of hard to look for alternatives, especially if your biggest distribution channel is brick and mortar. So these are the common challenges for startup and entrepreneurs. So um, I really want to share our current situation. Um, can you go forward, Krishna? Two slides. Thank you. Next. So. I really want to sh uh, back. Can you go back one? Thank you. So I really want to share our current situation for one of our social enterprises here in the Philippines. So Project Bangkal it's a social enterprise that empowers women, uh, empowers indigenous women through maca weaving. So for two months since during pandemic, we do not have income as i mentioned a while ago that bags and accessories are not prioritized right now and our supply is higher than our demand next
So for us to su survive as a social enterprise, first we um we are considering to pivot our social enterprise and look for another revenue stream. Also, um we can go online and market our products digitally. And for this one, since I mentioned earlier that logistics are restricted, um, try to serve first the niche market in your community. So you can just um, post your uh, products in the Facebook marketplace or selling group in Facebook. And also be transparent and honest regarding to the status of your enterprise because we are in pandemic, we really need help to recover and bounce back. It also build um, deepening trust between the management, employees, and of course, to your investors. Next. So these are um, sample businesses that pivoted during the pandemic. So as you may know, Ford and General Motors are car and truck manufacturers. So right now they are building ventilators for breeding machines and for hospitals. Also in our country, since tourism is greatly hit, hit by the pandemic, one of the social enterprises, it is a travel platform pivoted into an online market for the produce goods and products with their partnered um, indigenous people community. So if you want to pivot, uh, look first, look for essential products that are needed right now and ensure that you are capable of delivering those goods and services. Next. As I mentioned um, uh, earlier, since we are greatly hit by the pandemic, we are pivoting our social enterprise, which is Project Bakal, into From the Wild. Since our partnered um, indigenous people community has produced goods such as honey and herbal tea, we are helping 19 indigenous farmers right now to sell their produced goods. Next. Next. But the real challenge is how we cope up with post-pandemic situations. First, um, first create a business continuity plan. So review your whole value chains from raw materials, process into the end distributions. Next, assess in-house vulnerabilities. And these are financial and operational risk and cost escalations due to the pandemic and the shift in more sustainable eco-friendly services or goods change to even disaster to come for you to shift into environment of the government support so i know that in every country there are I know in that in every country there are financial assistance for enterprises for them to be able to somehow bounce back after the pandemic and lastly next I just want to share the story I read last night so in 1665 the University of Cambridge temporarily closed due to bubonic plague. So Isaac Newton had to work from home and he used his time to develop calculus and theory of gravity when he was 23. So I'm not saying that you should come up with life-changing mathematical equations during pandemic. Rather, use your time to see opportunities in, even in the darkest days. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kamai, for your, I think your suggestions um, from entrepreneurs uh, perspective are super, super practical and super useful. Thank you so much for your very honest and very sincere sharing. Um, so next, um, I would like to invite Ashish Kulab, um, thank you. I, I would like to invite Ashish Kulab, um, the board member of UN Major Group for Children and Youth. So over to you, Ashish. Hello, everyone. I'm based here. I'm a student here. 
uh, but originally I'm from New Delhi, India. And uh, thank you to YP Foundation and all the other organizers and supporters for providing me with this uh, dialogue and uh, much needed content as well. Uh, so actually, uh, what I have to speak about is a great segue from our previous speaker because you know I'm also speaking on the economic uh, impact slash economic dimension of of the whole situation. So, uh, you know, just to uh, pick up on uh, some of the things that our previous speaker had mentioned, uh, specifically, you know, about... Um, Sorry, Ashish, to interrupt you. Can you speak closer to the mic? This is better? I'm like right in front of you. Is it better? If not, then I can just change where I'm sitting, maybe. Hi, Ashish. I think um, a lot of people are saying that we can't hear you very properly. Um, maybe can you try to speak closer to the mic or um, maybe try um, if you have a separate set uh, headset. Is this better? Is this better? Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, yes. Okay. I think now it's better. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so I won't go over my introduction again, but... Uh, what I'll just say is, uh, I think it's a great segue from our previous speaker. And I would like to pick up on one of the uh, facts she had mentioned, uh, specifically in the context of uh, a significant portion of the people being employed in uh, MSMEs, which is uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises. So, you know, I mean, while we talk about the economic dimension of uh, the ongoing um, current events and namely COVID-19 in this context, uh, you know, we also have to keep in mind that a majority of the world uh, actually derives its livelihoods uh, either from the informal uh, economic sector or a small and medium, uh, small, medium and micro industries, you know, and uh, given um, what is happening in terms of the slowing down on uh, economic activity, the different degrees of lockdown that have been imposed in uh, different countries, uh, the workers in the informal sector and workers in the small and medium enterprises are probably the worst affected. And there are several reasons uh, for why this uh, takes place. Uh, you know, and I mean, intuitively speaking, one could say that, you know, I mean, because they're in the informal sector, the social safety nets and uh, the access to relief programs, uh, the access to uh, mechanisms that will lead to a better recovery are uh, scarcer and uh, harder to come by uh, you know and this is also true for the employees that that work within these businesses not just the businesses uh, themselves uh, also something we've observed is that even within the formal sector the smaller medium and micro enterprises are finding it harder to be able to navigate uh, different uh, government policies uh, which enable uh, an economic package uh, for the private sector and, and for the economic actors. And, you know, I mean, of course, this is also due to a number of things, uh, including uh, the institutional capacity to navigate complex economic and legal frameworks uh, at times, which are placed as barriers to any uh, relief, uh, recovery, and uh, support package. So, you know, I mean, that's the, that's the basic uh, overall picture. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, we also know that um, smaller companies, uh, you know, I mean, if you look at uh, the trend certain investors are following in uh, different stock markets around the world, they're actually betting on the fact that there will be more consolidation of economic activity with uh, bigger corporations. And there's going to be a significant reduction in the number of uh, smaller players in different sectors. Now, for many reasons, this is uh, a scary thought. And, you know, for 
most importantly because this leads to further income inequality and this leads to further wealth inequality and it also leads to uh, a lower level of employment because we know that msmes and the informal sector employ more people uh, per unit of economic activity and more people in absolute uh, terms as well so this is you know a very brief overview of where we are and a brief uh, peek into what many people are saying the future will probably look like uh, coming out of this covid uh, situation uh, so you know i mean i could get into more detail if if uh, if the organizers want or you know we can leave it more for uh, an interactive uh, q and a uh, but if there is you know i mean any specific uh, dimension or specific industry within the within the larger economic sector that you would want me to cover i can i can try and do that as well i mean i can give you one example you know i mean while we are saying that uh, smaller businesses and the informal economy is is and the workers within them are worse hit it is also true that in many countries and many communities it is uh, the smaller enterprises and the informal enterprises which have been able to provide more support to community members you know because of their local know how because of the fact that they are better entrenched into the local ecosystem their supply chains are less uh, complex and less affected by uh, what is happening uh, across the global economic chains so you know we are in a situation where uh, informal enterprises and small and medium enterprises are actually contributing the most outside and within the situation of covid and they're also going to be the worst hit and they're also going to be receiving the least support in uh, any kind of uh, relief and recovery package so you know this is something to think about this is something to also bring up to different policy makers and bring up in different uh, avenues of our advocacy and uh, it's quite important to to note that uh, any plan that looks at a post covid economy should significantly look at further strengthening uh, the small and medium enterprise uh, sector and also making uh, better social safety nets uh, safety nets and institutional protections available to informal enterprises and also workers within these informal enterprises you know so this is this is the general broad topic and of course there's a whole discourse on how to do a green recovery and how we need to rebuild the economy and the economic system in a way that is more uh, compliant with uh, planetary boundaries which is more in line with uh, natural ecosystems which is more in line with uh, different uh, knowledge systems that exist so you know i mean happy to to get more into that in discussions i know there's a lot of literature on that already but yes i mean i think uh, that's it for me from any initial comments if if you want i can go into uh, certain specific aspects of this or wait for the round to finish and then take more questions and engage in in the discussion yeah um thank you ashish i think um what you're saying um it's definitely helping us draw the bigger picture of what's going on what's happening here because i think um individually you know um being um, as employees or, um, you know, as a business operators, as entrepreneurs who needs to, you know, um, take care of the, the organization. So there are different levels of people and different levels of um, players, stakeholders are being impacted by the pandemic. So thank you so much for um, drawing the bigger picture. And um, I'm sure that it's going to be a very good, um, um, you know, um, context setting for our further discussion. So next, um, I would like to, before I invite the third speaker, um, I'm just going to do a quick energizer with everyone else here. So 
I'm gonna ask everyone to turn on your camera if you can, and we're going to take a selfie on our screen. So please, everyone, try to turn on your camera. All right, I see some people left. Um, I guess they will come back after the selfie, I guess. <laughs> um, so for those who decided to stay and leave your beautiful face in the group B, please try, please turn on your camera. Um, I can see that still there are people, um, uh, half of the people haven't turned on your camera yet. Or are you, are you still deciding whether you want to stay for the selfie and come back later? Right. Um, okay, so some people can't turn on your camera. And for those who can, um, let's maybe take another um, 20 seconds to, um, to wait for everyone. All right, um, so right for those who um, has camera turned on, um, you can, you know, make your favorite post um, or, you know, a hug or a beautiful face or pick a heart or, you know, like um, anything that you prefer to do. So on the count to um, three, um, we will take a screenshot and also you are very welcome to take your own screenshot. Okay. Um, so shall we start so everyone please um think about what kind of um hand gesture that you want to do so one two three let's do again one two three okay all right cool thank you everyone um and those who can't turn your camera, don't worry. We have your name's first letter um, capitaled on the screen. So I think you will be able to find your name there later on. Um, so let's invite, with our, let's invite our third speaker of today, um, Mr. Victor Anthony Lopez Pardman, um, is, who is the co-chair of Global Indigenous Youth um, Caucus. So over to you, Anthony. Uh, hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, really, really honored to be here and to be able to talk with youth from all over the world. See some familiar faces, but I um, would like to introduce myself. I'm Victor and I um, like was already said, I'm the co-chair of the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, which is uh, a body of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues um, that uh, specifically represents Indigenous youth uh, perspectives at, at the United Nations. And uh, we've been we've been operating for a while, but we were officially recognized by the UN in 2008. And uh, we coordinate at the international, national, regional levels. And uh, as co-chair, I get to work with uh, a lot of indigenous youth from, from all over the world. And it's an honor, but it's also um, during this, this time of the pandemic, it, it's also shown um, and highlighted a lot of the, the issues that we're talking about today, but um, a lot that are very specific to indigenous peoples, rural peoples, remote peoples, um, farmers, small farmers, fishers. Um, people who rely on the land uh, around them for their economy, for their food, for their culture. And um, I'll be talking a little bit about that today as well. Um, but I'm also a, a first year medical student at Harvard. And uh, I think uh, from what I've been seeing on, on the, the very strict scientific aspect of all this, <clears throat> I've seen that there's, there's definitely a wide gap. 
um, in the knowledge that's coming out and how it's being disseminated and how it's reaching uh, these communities. And so as we all know, you know, with this crisis, um, public health is incredibly important. Um, public health measures from the government uh, are, we've, we've seen that yeah, they're absolutely vital. And um, this virus, this pandemic has kind of highlighted not only in public health, but in many sectors of, of our society where our fault lines are. Um, it's bringing out a lot of uh, information, not only about the virus, not only about public health, but how our system perpetuates uh, disparities that are really exacerbating this virus today. Um, you know, when we think about public health, one of the main, uh, the main ways that we measure that are the social determinants of health. And uh, you know, in many, you know, in many countries and I would say in our society at large, uh, many populations don't have the necessary social determinants of health um, that they need and require to, you know, to have a fair fight against this, this virus. Um, and we've seen that the virus disproportionately impacts uh, the most vulnerable, people who are poor, people who are not wealthy, homeless, um, LGBTQ women, um, and and yeah, and so elements of health, you know, I think I think we're seeing that um, we live in a, in a world and an economy that basically tells us if we don't work hard enough or if we don't work in a certain way, then we won't be afforded um, opportunity. I, I come from the United States, and um, you know, as everyone knows, this is uh, a capitalistic country, and also one that that has you know. Um, pretty strongly gotten behind the idea of the social determinants of health and public health, yet still, uh, you know, actively fights for a, a system that that is bound to leave people without them. Uh, and so I'm seeing all of these these patterns, and I think a lot of, you know, people around the world are seeing them too, that, um, that our world, the system that we live in is not one that promotes public health for all. Um, in the United States, one of the key uh, public health battles, and I think in a lot of other countries, is the measures that are being put in place by governments, do they go against personal freedoms? This has been one of the, the major, I think, public health failures in a lot of countries where people are not in a position where they trust their governments enough to um, to actually abide by the information those governments are putting out. And this is a public health crisis. In the United States, we see people who are saying coronavirus is a hoax. This is something that was made up and is something that is being used by governments to, and you know, people in power to gain more power. Um, I don't believe that that's the origin of, of this pandemic, but it's really hard to um, to make an argument against that when governments and large corporations are actually using this as an opportunity to gain more power, to weaken legislation that protected the public health of the most vulnerable. I think this is being used as an opportunity in many ways. And we're seeing that, you know, in Brazil with uh, mining corporations being granted, um, you know, ease, uh, less restrictions on, on mining and um, and cutting and forest uh, forestry and in indigenous territories. We're seeing um, the Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S. Um, uh, the restrictions are being, you know, reduced on on all levels on climate change, um, and companies are still being allowed to move into indigenous territories that um, where the projects have been contested, but now uh, those populations can't really fight or continue to um, fight against projects that are detrimental to their public health because of the restrictions, because of the virus. Um, so I'm seeing, you know, a lack of global cohesion as a, a public health crisis in this case, but um, also the fact that information can't be trusted because we're not in a, in a, a position where 
essentially trust has been built. And this is one of the key aspects of, of making uh, public health measures successful. Um, and it's really hard to convince people otherwise um, when they don't trust uh, the measures that are being put out by their own governments. And so I think it's really important that we continue to build that trust, you know, in um, that governments uh, take it seriously. Uh, you know, governments, I think now, where I'm from and others are starting to to open up their countries again, opening up their economies. But, um, you know, against many of the recommendations from um, the World Health Organization and uh, other entities, um, and we know that, you know, the data has shown that this virus is hitting the most vulnerable um, much harder. Uh, it's hitting everyone, but, you know, again, I, I'll speak from where I'm coming from, the United States. I'm from two Native American tribes here. And um, we essentially are our only, the only public health measure we could put in place was to close our borders. And um, whereas cities and other, you know, and other um, metropolitan areas have pretty extensive public health networks, a lot of the rural remote territories in the U.S., they're only, the only thing they can really do is close their borders because they don't have clinics, they don't have access to physicians, nor do they have um, pretty robust public health measures in place or access to personal protective equipment and all of these, you know, really important public health um, precautions that, that, you know, that, that others have access to. So when we open up these countries, um, we have to ask how, you know, will will doing this impact the, the most vulnerable, the people who didn't have access to the public health measures um, that that others did. Um, and we're seeing, you know, as cases are going down in cities, um, they're starting to rise in rural areas. I mean, my tribe, we just got our first um, case uh, just yesterday. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite scary because we don't have a clinic, you know, we don't, we have one clinic, one doctor for a population of 5,000 people. Um, none of the equipment we would need uh, in an emergency in, in, in regards to Corona. And so these are these are definitely considerations. And I think we're going to have to to really question what kind of system we're going back to and how to make it work for everyone. And I think this virus is giving us a chance to really take a step back and, and look at society and think about the way that we promote people's health. Um, I think one of the major aspects of public health that's been missing is not only um, um, recognition of, of how past events have intergenerationally intergener impacted the public health of vulnerable communities, but how also looking to the future, how um, public health needs to think much further in advance. Um, so in my culture, and I know a lot of the culture of, of many indigenous peoples, um, we were planners. We're, we're very, this is one, one of the reasons why we're so sustainable is because we, in our political decisions and our public health um, strategies, we, we think generations in advance and we do things for the benefit of future generations. For my community, it's seven generations in advance. And we used to have, um, uh, meetings where the chiefs of our tribes um, would essentially meet, you know, just to talk about um, the future generations and how what they were doing today would impact um, the children's seven generations in the future. And I think this is an idea that's that's very simple, in, but a lot of countries don't exercise it or don't put enough energy behind the idea to actually make it effective. Um, and I believe that in our public health systems, whether it's government or on the community level, we need to start thinking that way. Um, I think that, you know, it's it's an essential human ethic that nations um, who don't consider the impacts of their decisions on future generations, um, it's morally negligent and it's insensitive because those generations don't have a voice and they're essentially voiceless and we have to speak up for them. Um, but similarly, on the other end, societies that that don't understand how their past, um, how their how their past, present or future conditions are a consequence of actions by preceding generations, 
um, they lack uh, intergenerational empathy needed to kind of rectify uh, intergenerational oppression and the consequences that are putting people in vulnerable positions. Um, so I think we need to keep our governments accountable for the actions of past governments. Um, we need to keep our communities accountable for the actions of, of, of past decisions and kind of build off of that. But at the same time, um, one of the most important things we can do for public health is kind of um, in a tangible and feasible way, figure out how we can work future generations into our discourse um, so that uh, you know, the next time this happens, we we're more prepared. I'm looking forward to talking more with, um, once we receive questions and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, I really enjoyed um, the, the whole um, conversation. And I think, um, so actually some of the participants also uh, messaged me how much they enjoy this overview as well. So um, I, I can't agree with you more. And I find it very interesting because um, I think, you know, um, that you are, you are a medical student and also at the same time you have this identity from, you know, uh, indigenous uh, community. Um, I was also, um, uh, privileged and lucky to work with um, a bunch of uh, indigenous young people in this region in Asia earlier this year. And um, I would have to say that I've never seen this, um, how to say, very pure um, caring for the community, for other people, this uh, collectivism. So I think um, your perspective is very, very valuable because you can see um, you actually in between a lot of um, communities, a lot of practice. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I can't agree with you more that, you know, there are a lot of um, people have their own opinions. And I think with where right now in this um, pandemic is actually a lot of time people are in conflicts, we're in conflict with each other of our value, our belief in future. And so and this is a very good time for us to talk about what is the future of humanity, right? Um, as the, the title of this webinar shows. So thank you so much for your sharing. Um, last but not least, let's welcome our um, the fourth speaker of today, um, Mr. Palab Chakma, the executive director of Kapan Foundation from Bangladesh. Welcome. Over to you, Palap. Hi, Mr. Palat Chakma, are you online? All right. Um, okay, so while we are waiting for him, um, I actually have a question for everyone because tonight we talk um, a lot about, um, we started with entrepreneurs and then um, we talk about, um, you know, um, uh, small medium enterprises so I just want to see how many of you are entrepreneurs can you just type um, that you are entrepreneurs in the chat so we know that how many of you how many of, of us are you know working in um, working in a, in a startup or you're running your own um, small medium businesses so please speak, you can type in the chat to let us know Right. And if you can type your location, that would be even better. Okay. We have Charles for Bangladesh working in a social enterprise. And we also have Sharifa um, from Malaysia, who's also a social entrepreneur.
right? Um, so um, while we're waiting for Palab and um, and thank you everyone for um, sharing that um, we do have representative from um, um, people working entrepreneurship here. Um, I just want to maybe um, ask a few questions for, for the first uh, three speakers. Um, we actually have one question from the audience um, to Ashish. Um, Ashish, if you're online, there's a question for you. Um, what are some solutions do you suggest um, for SMEs in India? Uh, maybe some concrete suggestions. And if any other two speakers want to share your uh, wisdom, um, feel free. So Ashish, what do you suggest um, Indian uh, small and medium enterprises? to, um, uh, how to say, respond in this COVID-19 situation. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's it's too broad a question. So, you know, m my response is also going to be a little broad because, you know, a specific response might be different for specific industries uh, based on uh, what line of products and services they might be in or what kind of an economic paradigm they function within. Uh, but, uh, you know, something all MSMEs and the MSME sector itself that can do better now is to better organize and, and uh, you know, together advocate for better uh, reconstruction and recovery plans and uh, systems that are easier to navigate in, in terms of accessing resources. Uh, something else they could also uh, do, you know, because something that differentiates, you know, there are many factors that differentiate it from uh, larger corporations, but something specific and more relevant for this context is that they are more nimble, they can move faster, and they can adapt faster. It's just, you know, like a smaller ship is easier to uh, steer than a larger one. So also to think about, uh, what kinds of sectors and goods and services they want to be in, uh, in you know, in the post-COVID or the transition to the post-COVID world. Uh, based on the regions of, of uh, what they see around and how they learn uh, things uh, to be going up and down. And you know, I also don't want to make this conversation just centering on demand and supply in this and that because i mean i had touched upon uh, a point uh, briefly and then uh, victor also elaborated uh, elaborated on it quite well i mean you know the whole endeavor to actually tangibly reimagine our relationship with the planet and societies that you know the economy uh, is placed within so you know that conversation and that thought process should not be lost so, you know, if I had to sum up, I mean, I would say better organize with your peers to advocate for policy frameworks that suit them and prioritize them over larger corporations, but also try and use their nimbleness and flexibility, try and see what kinds of uh, sectors and what kinds of product and service ranges they could get into with an eye of uh, what they want the post-COVID world uh, to look like. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ashish. Yeah, and, and I also agree that, um, you know, this is a, a, a such a huge question that um, everyone currently are looking for an answer. And, um, and I think um, I just we still need to keep trying and keep, keep searching. Um, so, Right. Uh, as we are speak, we're speaking. We have Mr. Palap back in the webinar. Um, so, right. So, without further ado, let's have um, Palap Chakma, executive executive director from Kapan Foundation um, in Bangladesh, to uh, to share with us. So, over to you.
All right, Palap, I think um, your mic is on mute. Hello? Hello? Yes, great. Okay, yes, thank we you. Can hear you. Okay, sorry. Uh, as here, I was having some power cut problem, that's why I was disconnected. But I will try my, my presentation as brief as I can. Um, <clears throat> my topic is a crisis of COVID-19 and environment issues. So here in Bangladesh, the first COVID-19 cases uh, was identified 8 March. And uh, since then, uh, the initial stage, the, the cases, the identified cases was very less. And, but now, after um, uh, 45 days now at present, the total cases identified in Bangladesh is uh, are 12,425. And uh, by this time, our government already took some measures and uh, uh, we are already under a lockdown situation. Uh, all government offices and also uh, uh, other offices are closed and uh, public transport is also uh, all, all sorts of public transport is also closed and um, industries except some uh, 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 urgent industries i mean who which industries are preparing uh, medical kits and also some pp pep so and also facial masks. So all those uh, uh, industries are open right now. Uh, so after the uh, lockdown, we the, the people, I mean the low-income people, are facing the problems uh, very much. And at the community level, I mean, if I describe about the indigenous communities. Uh, so most of the indigenous communities are poor, uh, landless, and also they are low-income uh, people. So they are suffering much because they are not allowed to go out for their jobs. To uh, as who are they never? Uh, they are also suffering, uh, suffering much. And also uh, at the community level, as we are, the, we are not getting access of a market. So people who are producing uh, agricultural products, agricultural goods, they are not allowed to take those products to the market for, for selling. That's why uh, their income, income is very less. And also uh, right now we are getting some frustrating uh, information reports from the community level that in many areas people are starving. So uh on the other hand government also taken some uh, initiative to uh, to provide uh, food grant and also ration to those people who are suffering out of this uh, pandemic and also out of this uh, uh, lockdown so but those government uh, ration and also uh, food grants are not sufficient according uh, comparing to their needs that's why uh, still from the community level we are getting uh, uh, urgent appeal from the community for helping them in this situation but uh, from the community soon after the uh, the cases were identified in bangladesh the different indigenous communities uh, they have taken some uh, emergency action and they, uh, they, uh, they pre usually traditional indigenous communities, they practice uh, some, some of their traditional uh, way of uh, uh, isolation. So in our community, I belong to uh, Chakma indigenous community from Chittagong Hill Tracks. So in my community, Chakma people in their village, they, they locked down uh, and we call it Adam Bon. So when this, uh, they start this Adam Bond practice, I mean the lockdown. Uh, they actually uh, uh, put some uh, bar or fans, uh, this bamboo or wooden made fans. So from that uh, uh, 
uh, practice, no person, nobody are allowed to go out, go out from the village uh, or locality, and also nobody are also uh, allowed to enter in the village. So that's this is the way how indigenous people keep people away from the uh, epidemic, and. Um, not only my indigenous community, but also other indigenous communities uh, in Chittagong um, Hill Checks and also in Plain Land, you know, indigenous people, they are also uh, practicing or right now uh, enforcing their respective way of uh, self isolation, way, traditional way. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, when they are facing all this problem uh, what we are we are informed uh, within the village indigenous people they are helping each other I mean the who are solvent and he he or they are helping to the people who are suffering or who are starving but I don't know how long they will they will maintain all this uh, good and friendly relations but uh, in coming days I I think they will face more problems uh, regarding the food. And also, uh, indigenous leaders, tradi traditional leaders also did some tremendous job regarding the uh, making people aware about, about this uh, COVID-19. Because uh, at the initial stage from the government side, government uh, pre prepared some um, uh, information kits and also to make people aware about this uh, COVID-19 and how to be uh, free and um, uh, free from this uh, and COVID-19 and how to maintain hygiene and the other things I mean the washing hands and also using hand sanitizer all these things but those uh, announcement and also uh, materials were in national language. That's why for making indigenous people aware about this uh, uh, information, I mean the government information, just to make people aware, indigenous leaders, traditional leaders, they prepare some indigenous language, some, some uh, information tools to, to make people, indigenous people, aware in indigenous language. So it helps tremendously to make indigenous people who are living in remote villages, who don't understand the local, uh, national language. So uh, the, the traditional leaders, they played uh, excellent job in this regard, I must say. Uh, and also our indigenous women, they are the one of the, uh, uh, vulnerable section of, in our society and in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation the indigenous women are also suffering most because they are the one who are taking care of the children they are one who is the managing uh, households work so they, they are also uh, preparing food all these things for the family members so they are also suffering and there we have um, learn uh, from different sources that uh, in this uh, time of uh, lockdown people in the in the family they are, they are having some uh, uh, family problem including the domestic violence but so far uh, we didn't heard such cases from indigenous uh, uh, families or indigenous villages and um, but still women are vulnerable and they need a special care and a special attention uh, in this situation and uh, another thing I must say, uh, suppose right now uh, in most of the villages, people are facing uh, food shortages and in coming days, it must be uh, much higher than this time. So we need to prepare community people to, uh, to make them aware. And we as a whole, as a community, we also need to uh, 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 look uh, some of the options, explore some of the options, how to make our people uh, safe 
uh, from uh, from this starvation or or to make ensure the food security for the community this would be another uh, challenge and uh, uh, in this situation what we also expect that um, government agencies who are working behind all this work they need to uh, generate some, some of the data i mean the data desegregation uh, by ethnicity so if we have the data uh, which village, which uh, um, villages are much, much uh, vulnerable in this situation, which uh, villagers need help or support from the government or any other or who are starving. So if we have this information or how many uh, people are identified from the uh, cases that are identified, so we can immediately take action uh, accordingly but if we don't have uh, the information data how many villagers are suffering from uh, uh, covid 19 cases how many people are not are maintaining home quarantine and institutional quarantine so all this information if we have in a uh, in a data database it is very helpful for us to take actions but if we don't have so it is uh, uh, it will be a mess we can imagine so uh, we expect our government will uh, or government agencies and also uh, non government organizations will come forward to generate information by ethnicity so that we can take uh, 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 action accordingly and also i must say in this situation uh, uh, everywhere we are uh, we, we are uh, maintaining uh, we are living under uh, lockdown so we are not allowed to go out uh, from our home and also our people are are not getting access of market that's why they are uh, suffering most I mean the low income uh, people so in this situation indigenous youth in our society they are also playing a tremendous role they themselves are raising funds for the uh, for the community they are moving but right at this moment they are not going door to door uh, physically but through the social media they themselves uh, created a platform created several platforms they are urging uh, urging to uh, people who are uh, well only well, they're appeal, appealing to all the people to help the community people who are starving and also they, they are i mean the some of the young artists they are selling their artwork for raising funds and also some young uh, singers dancers they are also making some um, uh, entertainment uh, entertainment um, items and they are showing it on facebook on social media and they are urging general people to come up and helping to raise uh, fund so that's that is how in the indigenous youth are mobilizing themselves for making fun for the vulnerable people i mean the community people so this is very positive things from uh, our side so far i i observe and i also uh, I, I'm also involved in one of such uh, uh, fundraising activities, and we are uh, engaging more indigenous youth, and they are actively working to uh, to to help the community people to survive in this um, critical time. And also, uh, I, I'm not sure how much time I I, I have in left i left can you hear me yes we can hear you um but sorry mr palab um we're running out of time uh, maybe if you, you can wrap up your um sharing a bit um shorter okay uh um, yeah i don't finally i i i just will say some few words on the environment so when we observing complete lockdown, countrywide lockdown, we observe that uh, we are seeing the very clear uh, and clear sky and green trees. There is 
no pollution in the air and also uh, it was no it was reported that there are there are dolphin dolphins there are they came closer to the beach in Cox's Bazar. So in previously, in last 20 years, we never seen this type of situation. So in my locality, in Chittagong Hills is where I am living. Now there are lots of birds are, are charming, are flying. So this is the, these are the, some symptoms that how environment is just uh, uh, flourishing. So if we can uh, keep this momentum, uh, by following uh, the maintaining green climate, uh, green energy, uh, creating green jobs and sustainable and, and inclusive growth for the incoming um, the economic development so we can maintain this type of environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Palab. Um, yes, um, and uh, right, as we are a little bit um, uh, uh, delayed um, uh, for the, our schedule. So we are going to um, shorten our Q&A. So in case you have, um, you know, burning questions that you really, really want to ask um, to the speakers, please um, type right now um, in the chat. Um, but I think with limited amount of time, we won't be able to address all of them. Um, but I also do want, um, since we're talking about all these topics, you know, sustainable economy, uh, health and in, and also indigenous communities. Um, I think one thing that I really want each speaker to conclude this um, sharing with one or two sentences is what do you think, uh, what is the biggest lesson learned for us um, to think about the future of humanity? Um, I don't I don't see any burning questions on the chat yet, so um, I would like to just have um, each speakers to share one or two sentences. Um, to, um, what's what's your biggest lessons learned for the future of humanity? So let's start with Ms. Tamai. Right. Um, maybe we'll come back to you later. Um, Hi, everyone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We can hear you now. Okay. Hi, everyone. So one of the uh, biggest lessons I learned um, during pandemic um, is that we should care for our environment too. We should care to, uh, to the whole ecology because um, we are in a world right now that um uh hello hello yes we can hear you yes we can hear you uh, okay i think her line dropped um so should we move on to ashish i'm here is is, is there a specific question for me so just share one thing, uh, one sentence or two about the, um, your reflections of um, our lessons learned for the future of humanity. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I mean, I think, I think it's a time to reflect and build and I mean, reflect, organize and seek to build what we uh, gather from these reflections. Thank you, Ashish. Um, Victor? Uh, hello? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, yeah, my, I think the, the big takeaway for me is uh, we need to, you know, when we think about this virus, we, we talk about, you know, um, how is, um, the vi you know how is the virus making um exacerbating already um the disparities that exist and i think uh it's just giving us a chance to step back and to think about how we can reimagine um the structures um because this we've had uh pandemics in the past and we'll have them again in the future and um, i think right now it's a good chance for us to 
for everyone in their communities to um, to take take stock of, of what they're experiencing and kind of use that to promote the health and the safety for future generations. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, Mr. Palak? Uh, yes. From from this uh, COVID nineteen situation, the, the the great learning is that uh, all people are equal in a sense. Where if we consider the rich and poor, urban people and rural people, all people are are that infected in um, uh, COVID nineteen. So we all should together consider to respect our um, our. Uh, maintain the ecology and also uh, to promote the and environmental sustainability together. Thank you. Um, thank you so much um, to all the panelists and speakers. Um, so we're now moving on to the last session of today. Um, so we're talking about we're going to talk about some synthesis and uh, next step and call to actions. So with that, um, I would like to invite Ms. Regine, um, who is the founder of SDG Village Manila and UN Advisor Asia Youth Council to, um, to share with us. So over to you, Regine. Hi, good evening. Can I be heard? Yes. Can I be heard? Okay, first of all, happy birthday. <laughs> Sorry to, to, to put that out there, but uh, we're really grateful to have you on, on this special day and also all the other um, partners who came out tonight. Um, we both have traditional and also non-traditional um, speakers and later on my friend Bushan too. So I want to start by saying that one of my key reflections during this quarantine is that the quarantine asked of us to be more innovative, turning loss into opportunity. So which is why I think that this webinar is very timely and very um, necessary. Um, my own journey as a social entrepreneur myself started from COVID-19. I come from a business family in the Philippines, everything um, urban savvy, space smart homes, electric tricycles. So it, it only begs, the pandemic begs us to ask the question, what do we do with our privilege? And it's not just economic privilege, but you know every other type of human capital that we have and other people don't. And it goes beyond our comfort zones. You know, um, looking at because in in times of emergencies, that's when you actually step back and and think what are the working solutions on the ground right at your very home, right at your neighbors' homes, your own employees, and your own local communities. And obviously we are an SDG generation at the same time, you know, Linka and everybody um, in this webinar, we've been to so many youth conferences, we've organized a lot of webinars, um, produced publications on SDGs. So my friends and I came together to launch SDG Village Manila. We work closely with local governments and urban planners towards locally driven solutions to sustainable urbanization. We ask SDG questions on the ground during relief and after relief. So as you know, we, there, are, there have been a lot of fundraising campaigns, but where does, do the SDGs fit in here? For instance, um, in the Philippines, the Department of Social Welfare and Development does not traditionally include um, public transport drivers in its definition of poor, poorest of the poor. But because of the pandemic, because of the lockdown, and um, public transport vehicles have been prevented from 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 going out and you know earning a living now the public transport drivers are among um the most hit of, of the pandemic so now we have to to rethink how we define poverty and how we build the resilience of these particular communities and then um another question that i think we didn't really touch on too much how about gender appropriate lens during um during the response um, just look at simple things like the food and supply kits that the governments distribute. Do we take into consideration the specific needs of different genders and also different ages? Um, one of the ideas that came out was um, to build incubators for youth and women empowerment in 
um, in the barangay level, which is the smallest unit of governance in the Philippines, because there seems to be a trend of um, political allergy towards innovation amidst um, dictator dictatorial regimes. And then um, I guess to close, um, that's just an example of what I'm trying to do on the ground, but but it's also a call to everybody, all young entrepreneurs and even young advocates to always um, act, as, as they say, act local, but think global. So look at the bigger picture from local to national to regional to global governance. For instance, um, I also represent the Asian Youth Council and I'm supposed to give my, my comment from um, an intergovernmental lens. So the International Youth Center in KL, they've, been, they've, they've met with um, Youth Co-Lab, UNDP. They've been, it's a venue to share best practices. Specifically, um, the, one of the main uh, themes is food security in the region. So we are a region that grows our own food. And there needs to be a conversation on the growing trend of urban gardening, but at the same time, how do we protect our rural farmers while we ensure um, food security? Finally, let's also look beyond the, the non-traditional intergovernmental and multilateral spaces. We have different actors, as I've mentioned here tonight. Um, I'm glad to have my friend who's gonna speak after me, Bushan from Global Shapers, and they've been actively following up on the World Economic Forum. Bushan and I are also part of the Friends for Leadership, which is an emerging horizontal platform of young social entrepreneurs worldwide. And it was launched at another economic forum called the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. So there are all these for working in silos. And, you know, this is the time to come together. It's now or never set aside our politics and focus on what's important. What a decade to be alive. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Regine. Um, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful um, overview and also a good call to action for everyone here. And next, I would like to invite uh, Bushan, uh, the country director of Kids for Kathmandu and country chair of uh, Global Shaper. Uh, am I horrible? Can, can you hear me? Great. Okay, can I request Krishna uh, to uh, put a picture that I have sent, uh, if that is uh, doable? And this, I'm not a country chair for global shaper, but I'm a country chair for global dignity. That the word is so messy. So, uh, Linka, it's not your fault. It's the word game. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bushar Dahal uh, from Nepal. Um, by the time, if we get some pictures, I would like to share some of the work uh, that. Uh, my organization here in Nepal that I am doing. Uh, so the major part of my work uh, is uh, revolves around an education sector. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you know that, but in 2015 we have this a big earthquake, uh, you know, uh, creating a lot of problems. And one of the major areas that was hit was a school uh, education. So from that point we started uh, building school, rebuilding public school. Uh, so we took that uh, that crisis as an opportunity to build some of the uh, beautiful public school in a uh, few of the re uh, remotest uh, part of the country. I wish I can show you the picture, which I'm sure will come uh, pretty soon to a school uh, and the, the kind of areas and the kind of school that uh, we are doing. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, we are also trying to digitize the classroom, especially in uh, in uh, in the rural areas where they don't have much of access with the technologies, computers, uh, and, and on all those things that we call uh, is an essence or like is a must for uh, today's uh, education system. Uh, so I'm I'm basically leading uh, these uh, kind of project. Uh, other than that, you know, I'm also uh, acting as an a lecturer in a business school. So uh, starting from very junior level of education till university level education, I'm trying to put myself as a student to learn the perspective of education. So uh, in this uh, discussion, you know, from last uh, uh, hour and a half, we have been talking about, uh, you know, the, the environmental factor, the sustainability, you know, and how uh, you know, SDG goals can be incorporated. So what we are trying to do is, thank you so much. So the picture that you can see is uh, one of the school that uh, we have just built. You know, you can see uh, the area, the location, and and the need uh, that we try to address. So, and taking this school construction one step further, what we have done is we have introduced uh, this rammed earth technology, which is more again a sustainable method of construction. You know, we use very less amount of cement, very less amount of uh, rebars and everything. So just trying to be more, uh, 
trying to uh, create a school which is more green and trying to be more uh, working together with nature. That is what we do. And uh, Regine uh, rightly mentioned, for this, you know, uh, now we are in this global era where you know, a bunch of these amazing uh, organizations all around the world. Like, if you look into your surrounding, you can see these few amazing organizations, like Global Shaper, on each hub that if uh, uh, each hub that the whole world uh, hosts. You know, uh, the organization like French Leadership, which region and I am part of. Uh, I mean, as promoting the culture of dignity all around the world. So, I mean, all these organizations are acting. From their respective fields and uh, like putting on their expertise but i think uh, it's a time where we need to uh, bring our collective effort together and solve the problem that we are facing right now in the modern way where uh, you know the rightly used word is uh, forget about competition is, is of collaboration and this is the time where we can do a lot of collaboration uh, so at the end uh, today in nepal we are celebrating a birthday of Lord Buddha, uh, who has always tried to convey the message of peace uh, all around the world. So uh, I would like to uh, end my message saying that may, th may there be peace in the all around the world and COVID uh, ends uh, us uh, leaving us an opportunity to make this world a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Bushan. That's a very, very beautiful message that um, you are giving. Um, so, right, um, last but not least, um, I would like to invite my colleague, uh, Ding Long, in the call um, to share a little bit about, um, so I think we talk a lot about, you know, um, youth development through social entrepreneurship tonight. Um, and some of you might have already experienced, you know, um, as some of you say that you're entrepreneurs. Uh, but if any of you are curious, what is it about and how is it going to, um, you know, just want to learn a bit about it. So we're going to offer you uh, this opportunity. So I'm just gonna have my colleague Ding Long from UNDP to share a bit about um, some, the call to action from our site. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Linka. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, so I was asked to speak about uh, call to action. So what to do after we talked about all these issues. And first, I wanted to acknowledge and thank really uh, Kamai, Palab, Victor, Ashish, Bushan, Regine, Ninka. Uh, I didn't forget anyone um, um, for sharing um, like your experiences. And I think I forgot um, Miss Rubina Adikari uh, in the beginning. Uh, so everyone, um, yeah. So thank you so much for sharing. It was very interesting. Um, we traveled to Philippines, we traveled to Bangladesh, we traveled to the US, uh, we traveled to Thailand, uh, so we traveled to Nepal. Um, so it was so interesting to hear about the issues from all these perspectives, from all these countries, from the health lens, from the indigenous community lens, from the youth entrepreneurship lens. Um, so yeah, so I think one thing I remember from today is um, that now, what if humanity was actually climbing up stairs, uh, going to one direction? And now each stair is, one stair is about social issues, uh, people who don't have the same access to health, people who don't have the same access to education. Another stair, another step is about the climate change that humanity has caused. And what if COVID-19 was another step in the dramatic direction where we are already heading? and as so many people mentioned, what if we literally took a step back, start to think what world do we want to live in, in the post-COVID-19 world? Um, what do we want for the future of humanity? And what kind of futures of humanity do we want? Do we want a world where we leave everyone behind? Or do we want a world, a world where we leave no one behind? Do we want a world where we collaborate, cooperate? And as Victor said, do, you want, do we want a world where uh, we think seven generations ahead. Um, I really loved uh, when you mentioned this. Um, so yeah, I think the, the answer is obvious for most of us here. I mean, I hope so. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to share um, one uh, maybe call for action for uh, those who are listening to us today, um, which is one of uh, our program with Youth Collab, which is called the Movers Program, um, which is basically um, a program we launched to help young people to take action 
um, for the SDGs, for social entrepreneurship, um, basically for young people to who want to take action but don't know how to start. Uh, we want to provide them with the tools, with the knowledge, with the guidance to organize events about the SDGs, to organize events, to raise awareness about what is the concept of social entrepreneurship. Um, we mentioned it a lot today, uh, but it might not be obvious for many people uh, outside of this webinar. And yeah, if you are young people, uh, you are interested in the SDGs, interested in social entrepreneurship, and you also have this growth mindset where you want to have an impact, develop your soft skill, leadership skills, uh, feel free to have a look at the link that Linka um, just shared in the chat, and hopefully we can uh, all work towards the future of humanity where we leave no one behind. So yeah, thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity to share, and over to you, uh, back to Linka. Thank you so much, Dinglong. Um, yeah, so I think this we're up, um, at the end of our webinar, but um, I just also um, want to share a good news for everyone that even though this is the end of this webinar, but it's actually the start of a series of webinar um, that were brought to you by the same organizers, um, the uh, Y feed. Um, so, so please stay tuned for the up upcoming webinars and um, yeah and stay awesome stay safe stay healthy and hope to see you very soon bye everyone thanks for joining bye 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 bye, bye. bye. bye.